Um, good afternoon. My name is Susan Knaba, and I am the acting dean here at the Faculty of Information and Media Studies. So, as part of my official welcome, I would like to first um, I would first like to recognize that Western University is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lunape, and Attawandaran peoples, who have long-standing relationships to the land and region of southwestern Ontario and to the city of London. The local First Nation communities in this area include the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, the Oneida Nation of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation. In the region, there are 11 First Nations communities and a growing indigenous urban population. Western values the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island, um, North America. I am delighted to welcome you all here today for FIM's homecoming programming, A Citizen's Guide to Real News, Why Trusted Local News Matters. This programming is a collaborative event which grew out of Kathy English's mandate as the 2017-18 Asper Fellow um, here at FIMS, and she has really been instrumental in putting together this event. So please join me right now in thanking her for her leadership in making this happen. This event is particularly topical, not least because Monday marks the municipal election day across the province, underscoring the important relationship between local news and local politics, and the coverage of London's historic preferential ballot will no doubt make both local and national news this year. It's also very timely given the announcement on Thursday evening that TVO has received a generous donation of $2 million to expand um, and extend their uh, Ontario Hubs partnerships. FIMS has been very fortunate to be one of TVO's partners in the Ontario Hubs program, and Mary Baxter, from whom you will be hearing um, in a little while, is based right here at FIMS. Before I introduce your host for the afternoon, I would like to thank all of the people from FIMS who have helped to make this event happen. Tracy Faudry, Becky Blue, Aaron Carroll, Paul Buckley-Golder, Melissa Diamond, Charlotte McClellan, Ella Young, Lily Dang, and Marnie Harrington. I want to give a special shout out to Eric Flockhart and Angela McGinnis, or, yeah, McGinnis, who um, will very shortly be alumni members. Um, they walk across the stage next week at convocation to receive their Master of Information, or Master of, Master of Media in Journalism and Communication. Um, and they're helping to record this event for posterity. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce your host for the afternoon, Professor Paul Benedetti. Paul Benedetti has written for newspapers, magazines, and the web for more than 30 years. Paul worked for the Hamilton Spectator, Southern uh, News, uh, New Media uh, Lab, and the Sun Media's um, website, canoe.ca. In 2010, he won a Canadian National Newspaper Award for short feature. Last year, was it last year? Just last year? Then Dundurn Press published a book of his collected essays titled, you can, have the, you can Have the Dog When I'm Dead. In the bio he provided, he kindly noted that it had sold several copies. <laughs> Perhaps we can increase that um, over the next little while. Um, Paul is currently a full-time uh, faculty member here at the University of Western Ontario, where he teaches journalism, writing, and critical thinking in the Faculty of Information and Media Studies. He has recently been, uh, as recently as this week, um, being awarded the Dean's Award for Lifetime um, excellence in teaching. Sadly for the FIMS community and for me personally, Paul will be retiring from his position here at FIMS in December of this year. But we hope he, we can continue to trespass on his good nature to facilitate events like this in the future. Please welcome Paul Benedetti. Thank you, Susan. That's very nice. Well, it's very exciting to be here this afternoon, or, well, it is this afternoon, yeah. Um, and we have a, a terrific, uh, I think, presentation for you. So I'm going to guide you through that a little bit. And um, I wanted to say off the top that this whole afternoon reminds me of a bit of a bit that uh, Woody Allen did in the movie Annie Hall. I don't know if you remember it, but he tells a joke where there are two elderly women in the Catskills at a restaurant. And the first one says, 
boy, the food here is terrible. And the second one says, yeah, I know, in such small portions. Um, I think that's where we find ourselves today, both drowning in uh, fake news, unreliable information on the web, social media, Twitter, and all kinds of distorted and politicized information, while at the same time, we have a dearth of local news and local information. So what a conundrum. Again, to paraphrase Woody Allen, he said, it's not the, <laughs> on a different topic, it's not the quantity of the news you get, it's the quality, unless the quantity drops to zero. So as tour stars John Hondrick said in a recent um, op-ed, over the past decade, we've lost 137 community newspapers in Canada, from Abbotsford to Edmonton, from Kamloops to Oxbow, from Fergus to Timmins, from Exeter to Pembroke, and many, many more. Crisis, I think, is not too strong a word to use for both the misinformation that we're drowning in and the lack of information, local information particularly, that many communities face today. Well, luckily, we have a tremendous uh, group of speakers today to help illuminate and, I hope, uh, diagnose and maybe even offer solutions to the current problem. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce first a series of three speakers that will give talks. We'll have a break after that, and I'll introduce a panel of people working right around here in southwestern Ontario, locally on the ground, providing community news to the people uh, of this area. So the first person I'd like to introduce to you is Kathy English, and she will be giving her talk. She, uh, I'm happy to say Kathy is a friend of mine. Uh, she's the public editor at the T Toronto Star and has been for the last about 10 years. Prior to that role, it seems that she had trouble holding down a job because she worked for practically every major newspaper chain in Canada, including the Globe and Mail, the London Free Press, and others. She was also with uh, online, being an executive producer with Sun Media and Transcontinental. And that's where I met her when we were both executive producers at uh, Canoe. Those were happy times until Pierre Carl Pelado showed up. In any case, she also spent 10 years as a tenured full-time professor at Ryerson, where she taught journalism. And just this past year, she had the, uh, was awarded the Asper Fellowship here at Western and spent a, a term teaching a course, a graduate course in news and media, and also um, putting on this panel. So uh, that's why she's here. She serves as well in many roles in the journalism community, including being a member of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, and she's on advisory boards for Ryerson, Sheridan, and many other places. She is truly a leader in the journalism community. Kathy English. Thank you. Welcome. I'm uh, happy to see you here. Someone came in earlier and said that I was the backup plan if the football game didn't work out. So I'm glad that you, that you all came. Um, I also I, I want to thank everybody involved in organizing this event. And I really want to thank um, everyone from FIMS who gave me the opportunity to serve as the Asper Fellow last year. It was um, a real privilege. and. Having done both my undergrad and graduate degree at Western, it was a little bit of a bucket list thing to be able to come back to the school I went to and, and teach, so thank you. So today I'm going to tell you about the steps the Toronto Star and other media outlets are taking to earn your trust. What we um, in the media industry are now ca calling optimizing for trust. And what I hope you take away from this is some sense of what you should expect from the news outlets in your community and a means of recognizing what real news is, the news that matters to your community. I come to this from the perspective, first of all, as the public editor of the Toronto Star for 11 years now. It's a role that's existed since 1972, was set up originally to serve as an intermediary between readers and newsrooms. It's a form of media self-regulation. My job is ex to explain journalism to readers and the concerns of readers to, the, to journalists, which is really the key part for me. I also hold our journalists to account for journalistic standards and explain to the public when we fall short of those standards. Um, I communicate with some three to 500 readers every month, um, so I, I get an earful all the time. I do all the corrections and probably about um, 1,100 corrections every year. I also come to you having devised and taught the course in digital media literacy here last winter. Um, it was a really terrific course from my perspective. I have at least one student here. Um, 
We try to introduce students to the current challenges in media trust at this time of historical disruption, um, talk about the traditional and evolving role of journalism. And I was struck by a couple of students who said to me, you know, we all need to know this. We all need to understand the media ecosystem and how it's working right now. But our parents need to know this too. That l there's a lot of efforts in this country for media literacy in schools, but we need to be doing more of this, of talking to communities about what you should expect from news organizations. Mm -hmm. Maybe I think every single person in this room who is speaking today comes to you with a commitment to journalism and a sense that we know that journalism matters, even if sometimes our audiences don't. And to this I'm going to use the definition from the elements of journalism. Journalism provides something unique to a culture. Independent, reliable, accurate, and com comprehensive information that citizens need to be free. And however your news, a news organization might word it, this is an essential mission for all of us. Um, I don't think it's any surprise to tell you that we are in the midst of a deep global trust, uh, crisis in media trust. Um, surveys, studies around the world in the last couple years show us, you know, alarming levels of, of low trust in media. Everybody's talking about media trust, fake news, misinformation in what's been called our post-truth world. Um, certainly we know that the um, evolution of social platforms, which is really at the past decade have changed everything for media. We are now part of an ecosystem where misinformation is amplified and we have to figure out a way to tell our truth, to tell our story within, within that. There's a lot of evidence to indicate that there's low trust in, in social media, that um, social media is trusted less than other news media in its ability to separate fact from fiction. Um, a sense that um, your social media feeds are being polluted with inaccurate information. We could do a whole day-long symposium on all the research and, and information around that, but needless to say, I, I think the important thing is that the public is, is beginning to understand this, that, that, that what they are seeing on social media is probably n not trustworthy all the time, and they are looking for signals of trust. I am encouraged by the fact that this trust crisis is not as deep in Canada as elsewhere. And I don't know why that's so. None of the research has yet been able to tell me why. But the Edelman Trust Barometer that came out in January indicates that uh, trust in traditional journalism jumped 10 percentage points over the past year to about 61%, but still is only two-thirds of our audiences. Um, at the same time, less than a third of Canadians trust social media as a source of news. Both studies out of uh, Pew and the Reuters Institute had similar indications that news is high, or new, trust in news is higher in Canada than elsewhere. Um, the Reuters study found that uh, Canadians are top 10 in the world for media satisfaction. So there's a research study for somebody. At the same time, the, the uh, Edelman uh, barometer tells us that you know, we shouldn't become complacent. Trust may be rebounding, but there's an underlying skepticism. 63% of audiences are more cons think that we're more concerned with attracting a big audiences. 63% believe that we sacrifice accuracy to be first to break a story. I, I find that an alarming number. And 54% support an ideology, um, th that, uh, believe that we support an ideology versus informing the public, the old um, charges of bias. All of this is aligned with what I hear from our readers on a regular basis. This is no surprise. This is, this is when people are, are down in the media, these are the things they say. Edelman also found that there is fake news anxiety in Canada. 65% of Canadians, this was done, um, it was released in January, so it would have been done last fall. 65% of Canadians are worried about false information or fake news being used as a weapon. There was a particular concern at being tied to our elections, and certainly there are you know, steps being done at many levels, um, government and uh, NGOs. Uh, the Canadian Journalism Foundation has some efforts in to, to try and combat the use of false information during elections. I want to take a moment out here to talk about the F word. And 
anyone in my, who was in my class will know, we, 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 we decided early on in the term that we were not going to use the words fake news. Um, we looked at a study from, uh, or a report from Claire Wardle called Information Disorder, uh, put out by the Council of Europe, and she provided for us a taxonomy of how we talk about the, the problems within the media ecosystem. Um, those, the terms that she came up with, misinformation, misinformation being media mistakes, wrong stuff that gets out there, but with no real malevolent <laughs> intent. Disinformation is the really bad stuff in the middle. The false content, it's imposter content, manipulated, fabricated, these are the lies, this, this is the stuff that people are using to mislead. Malinformation would be leaks, hate speech, um, kind of information that is out there, but is probably still true. So even though I don't want to talk about fake news, and we're not going to use the word after this, um, it is an issue for journalists in Canada. We have a U.S. president who has weaponized the term, turned it against us. I know that I, I was watching the press conference, the first press conference he did as president, when he turned to CNN's Jim Acosta and wouldn't take a question and said, you're fake news. Sitting in my office watching that and I thought, this changes everything for us here too. And sure enough, I had been public editor for 10 years then. I had never heard that phrase. Within days, it started coming into emails of complaint to the public editor's office. You're fake news, you're fake news, you're fake news, and worse. Even this week, I got an email, someone didn't like one of our cannabis legalization stories, and the comment was, and I'm going to read you the parts that I can read, because the rest of it was so awful. This exposed your bias, and hence fake news status. Your credibility is low, perhaps in the negative region. Corrupt, incompetent, inorganized criminals, and social terror terrorists, the lot of you clowns pretending to be journalists. Um, I think that's a really hard atmosphere for journalists to work in right now. And in many ways, I think it's unfair. But what all this has meant is that this environment is a challenge and an opportunity for journalists. And increasingly, we need to prove that we are the real news, that we are not the noise and nonsense within the media ecosystem. And we are trying to optimize for trust. Who you're going to trust to tell you what happens in your community and why it matters is an essential question for every citizen right now. On the other hand, I think it's very fair to say we have to earn your trust. And like other newsrooms, the Toronto Star has got a lot of initiatives going on to earn your trust. This is just one of them. Um, we've appointed a transparency reporter who sort of provides the story behind the story um, on most weeks. Just sort of some basics. What is trusted news? Trusted news is news that is accurate, accountable, and ethically produced. It's very, very simple, really. Trusted newsrooms are accountable to readers. They operate with transparent journalistic standards and best practices in line with Canada's laws governing media. And something we keep saying in, around our newsroom is to build and maintain trust, we have to be trustworthy. And we're looking at, you know, what does that mean? I want to say that, you know, none of this is, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel here. Um, I've probably looked at the ethics standards of you know, two to three hundred news organizations around the world, and they're all built on basic values and principles that journalists hold true and that you should hold journalists accountable for. The journalism's first obligation is to the truth. The journalism's first loyalty is to citizens. The journalism's essence is a discipline of verification. How do you know what you know? How do you know what you're stating as a fact? and that journalists must maintain independence from those they cover. Um, so these are, you know, every, every news organization has a um, ethics policy that states these values in the, the words of that news organization. At the STAR, we're also a participant in what's called the Trust Project. It's a um, media, it's a global uh, consortium of media organizations that are doing, again, what we call optimizing for trust, looking really at digital content and how to create trust in the digital content that you come across unattached. It, 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 it's not part of, you know, pr a lot of people don't go to home pages anymore, so you're getting the news, one piece that you've come off of Facebook, 
So the, the trust project um, asks us to jump through a lot of hoops to earn that trusted T. Uh, we have to do things like make sure our ethics policy, our um, information about who we are and what we stand for in the community is embedded in every single piece of content. It's also asking for indicators of trust about individual journalists. Every piece of content now has um, a bio of the journalists. Who are they? What, what's their education? What, what do they cover? Um, again, with the idea that, that news consumers can make decisions um, about whether that's a trustworthy journalist and a, a trustworthy um, news organization. So the Globe was a phase one participant in Canada. Uh, CBC, CP um, um, have all uh, signed on for phase two and we just announced a couple weeks ago. At the star, though, we, 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 well before we started any of this, our new CEO brought us together and said, you know, trust is important. As, as we go out to ask people to subscribe to us, we need to say, what do we believe in in terms of trust? So he asked us to come up with a Torstar trust con contract and, and asked us to, to limit it to five things. What are five essential things that we will promise our audiences across Canada um, and that we will all sign on to. So I'm going to take you through those five things and then I'll, I'll be able to wrap up. So the first thing is, and, and, and most of this is aligned with all of the various trust initiatives that are going on uh, right now. The first one is easily viewable company journalistic standards, advertising standards, and ownership information. You should be able to come to our website, go to a newspaper, on any platform, know what the Toronto Star stands for in the community, know who runs it, know who owns it, um, know what its ethical standards are. Number two, a trusted news organization should correct its errors in a transparent manner on all of its platforms. There should be no games about, no, that's not worth correcting, no, that's not a serious error, so we won't correct it. Accuracy is a paramount principle of trust. And every study I've looked at, you know, I think the first um, news credibility study I looked at was from 1985 from the American Society of Newspaper Editors. and all of those studies tell us that it's, it's, it's really true what people say, that if you don't spell my name wrong, what else did you get wrong? So we're trying to sort of be fiends about at, um, corrections and correct in a clear, transparent manner. A trusted news organization should make a clear distinction between news and opinion content. This has been one where we've had to do a lot of work. We've always identified opinion content in the paper with a headshot of a columnist. As it turns out, lots of people don't know that that means it's a piece of opinion content. So we've come, d done a very um, vigorous labeling program with a, um, every piece of content has to be labeled. Is, is it news? Is it opinion? Is it a review? We have a glossary on our website that tells you what all of those labels mean. I think this has become increasingly important in this world of always on cable news where people, you know, they see a, a, a banner that says breaking news and then you get about a bunch of talking heads spewing their opinions and people, a lot of people don't understand the distinction between news content and opinion content and it's really important. We define news as being based in verified fact and opinion is based on perspective, perspective and judgment of those facts. Um, there's a lot of indication that um, labels can help readers better distinguish between news and opinion and that that is one of the um, building blocks of trust. So yeah, a lot of work to get that done. A trusted news organization, in our view, should also provide a diversity of views on issues of public interest um, in both news and opinion articles and opportunities for readers to express their views in op-eds, columns, letters to the editor, social reader engagement. Um, I'd say this is the one where most media in Canada falls down the most still. Uh, we don't represent our communities well enough in terms of diverse voices. We're making efforts. And you know, at the Star, we killed online comments, which were a way to interact, not, not always the most civilized way. But there's a lot of discussion about how do we live up to this obligation to, to, to be a place, kind of the living room where the diversity, the diverse voices can come to talk. And finally, a trusted news organization needs to make a clear distinction for you between what is news, opinion content, and what is paid content, advertising. 
There shouldn't be any games about, you know, trying to pass off something that is really paid for by the advertising department and make it look like news. So we've had company-wide discussions around this, around labeling, making sure that any sponsored content is labeled, that readers, my, the bottom line for me, what I took into the, a meeting when I said, my perspective was that readers should never be confused about whether they're reading paid content. They need to know. We also have, have really tried to open up our, ourselves to listening. And I, I, when I did a column about some of our trust initiatives, I asked readers for input. I got about 600 emails, and it was so gratifying to see how much, how serious our community treats what we do and, and what we mean to them. And, you know, I got, like, essays from readers about all the things the star could be doing better to earn, earn their trust. And people do understand this. So i just sort of given you some excerpts for some of them. Integrity, accuracy, factual and balanced reporting. It's a difficult balance, no doubt, for the media to weigh the need for revenue and to stay true to the higher purpose of journalistic integrity. I believe that first and foremost, the four tenets above must be adhered to without compromise. I think that reader gets that. Dear editors, in an age where media bias, conjecture, and fake news are demonstrably rampant, the idea that you're willing to listen to your readers is a boost of confidence in your company. That's what this is all about, trying to listen and, and learn together. So I just want to wrap up um, with being a little bit prescriptive of what media companies and journalists can do and what consumers can do. So certainly media companies, we need to hold ourselves to the highest standards of ethics and excellence. We need to be accountable, we need to be transparent, and we need to explain what we do, how we do, and, and why we do it. Our um, new revised ethics code sets a pretty high bar for that for star journalists and editors. It says, we should be prepared to explain publicly what we do in gathering and presenting news and information and the journalistic judgments involved in all we publish. I call that radical transparency because it's not always easy and it's not always easy to put editors and reporters on the spot and say, explain to me, why did you make the decision? Why did you put this person in the story? Why is this an anonymous source when that is not in line with our policy? But we need to be able to explain because readers want this. What can news consumers do? All of you, hold your news sources to high ethical standards. Expect something of us. You're a consumer, you are, you are our core customer, you should expect something from us. Expect transparency, expect accountability. And uh, be curious about how the sausage is made. Ask us if you don't understand you know, what, how we do something, how decisions are made. I think increasingly the, the, it's on us to create some news fluency, news literacy uh, uh, amid, amid our audiences to, to help you understand. And finally, before I turn it over to Paul, who will introduce April, um, and April's going to talk about local news crises, um, pay for quality journalism. Consider, subscribe to a news source that you can trust. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kathy. That was uh, extremely interesting. Just the topics you uh, touched on could fill an entire term and an entire year, as the students in the audience know. Um, it's a real pleasure to move now from, I think, quality to quantity, and that'll be the issue that Professor April Lindgren uh, challenges us with today. Um, like most of our speakers, uh, Professor Lindgren comes out of a journalistic background, having uh, done political and economic reporting on the Hill and at Queen's Park for um, global television news and also for what used to be the southern chain of newspapers where I worked and became Ken West and then became all kinds of different things as we all know. Um, she joined the School of Journalism at Ryerson in 2007 and is the founding director of the Ryerson Journalism Research Center. Uh, this year she has the honor of being the Velma Rogers Research Chair and Principal Investigator for the project that I think she's going to talk about today, the Local News Research Project. Working in coordination with colleagues in British Columbia and at Royal Roads, Professor Lindgren has spearheaded the creation of a local news map. I think all of you have heard about food deserts, right? Where there's not enough good food for people. Well, I think the corollary is an information desert, and that's what we're going to hear about today. Professor Lindgren.
Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and I'm going to talk indeed about uh, local news. I'll touch first on why local news matters and then I'll talk about the work that we've been doing at the Local News Research Project, which I lead. Um, work that indeed suggests that access to local news is increasingly at risk and unevenly available across Canada. Um, so first, uh, a few minutes on why local news matters. And the underlying premise of the research that we do uh, is that there actually is re good reason to be concerned if journalists aren't covering city council or reporting on the latest arrests uh, downtown or uh, investigating, investigating how money uh, raised by the United Way charity is being spent. There's not a lot of Canadian research actually on this, but we can look to work done in other places to, um, to help understand why local news matters. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the United States, the uh, Knight Commission on the Information Needs of Communities, I think, summed it up really well when it concluded that information is, as they put it, as vital to the healthy functioning of communities as clean air, safe streets, good schools, and public health. Um, scholars have actually been more precise in that they've identified eight uh, different types of critical information they think that citizens need to successfully navigate everyday life. So this includes information uh, about emergencies and risks, about health, education, transportation, uh, economic opportunities, the environment, and civic and political matters. So if you just think about uh, local health news, for instance, why is that a critical information need? Well, for instance, it's often uh, a local news story that raises the alarm for parents and authorities if, say, there's a, a measles outbreak at the local school. In fact, Scientific American recently uh, held, had a story um, uh, about epidemiologists' reliance on local news stories about infectious outbreaks um, as an early warning system that alerts them uh, to possible serious pro problems uh, that could spread. And what they were saying is that in the absence of these stories, uh, their ability to detect and counter outbreaks uh, early on at the community level is actually really se severely hindered. But it's easy to think about other examples. Uh, you know, a story about a major hiring spree at this university, for instance, would be ec important economic news. Um, and new but news coverage means that that information about those opportunities are disseminated widely to people who are looking for jobs and not just to people in the know. But I'm going to go beyond anecdotes for a minute and talk about what researchers have concluded uh, about the value of local news. Um, first is the obvious one, local reporters hold uh, power accountable, local power accountable. So scholars in the U.S. have linked declining newspaper circulation to increasing government corruption. Um, more precisely, the researchers found that, as they put it, government performance improves as citizens have more precise knowledge on both the policies adopted by politicians and the environment in which they are limited implemented, providing that competitive elections are in place to punish the incumbent. Uh, you know, further to this point, uh, journalism has been described as the first draft of history or the literature of, of, of civic life. Uh, and I'm not just talking about news as being a, something of interest to local history buff. It matters in that the production of a reliable record of civic life helps, again, hold power accountable. It means we have a record of what politicians said and what they did, so we can compare it uh, to what they're saying and what they're doing now. Local news, I think, also matters because it builds community and social cohesion. Um, so it connects residents by providing them with a shared set of facts and information. So, you know, none of us maybe witnessed that terrible accident down the street or the great play at the local little theater. But, you know, if we both have access to local news reports and reviews, we can talk about it, we can debate it, um, we can share a sense of belonging and, and a stake in our community if we know what's going on. Um, further, that to, further to that, the research suggests that knowledge about local fuel issues fuels civic engagement. So access to information equips people with information they need to uh, work collectively. So you know it's difficult for us to band together to fight that expressway going, uh, that's going to be built at the end of our street if we actually don't know there's going to be an expressway built at the end of the street. In the U.S., researchers have concluded that civic engagement actually declined in Seattle and Denver immediately following the closure of local newspapers in those, communi in those two cities. Closer to home here in Canada, there's some research that suggests that they call a low information environment, uh, so one where there's only limited news and information available, contributes to the re-election of incumbents, particularly at the municipal level. Um, uh, what are the other reasons local news matters? Well, we held a conference at uh, Ryerson last year uh, where we invited uh, a councillor from Guelph, where the Guelph Mercury uh, had closed down. And um, his point was he thinks that the lack of um, a newspaper providing more in-depth coverage was contributing to pol more polarized debates. 
So the pared back news outlets that were still operating in the city, he said provide, you know, he said, she said type of coverage, but there's not more any more anal as much of a supply of analytical pieces that explore alternatives um, to, to divisive issues or solutions to divisive issues that are perhaps being pursued in other communities and might be an option for their community. Finally, in the absence of verified, timely, independently produced news, there's a vacuum. And who fills that vacuum? Well, special interests can set up websites that look like news sources. Governments take to producing stories, um, I should say stories, that cash strap newsrooms um, can use for free. And uh, you know, that's what Doug Ford is doing and other politicians are doing. And municipal communications officers or t officials are telling me that it's not unusual now for their press releases to just be picked up and published verbatim. Uh, in other words, you know, taking away local the loss of local journalism opens the floodgates, I think, for rumors, self-serving propaganda, and even deliberately concocted fake news. So I want to return now to my earlier point about local news addressing those aid information, critical information needs. Now the research on this, uh, that research underpins my thinking on what I call local news poverty. And I suggest local news poverty exists to varying degrees in places where one or more of those eight information needs are not being met. So I want to introduce you then, uh, talk about uh, two of our projects. The first is the local news map, which checks changes to local news outlets across the country. And the second is a separate study where we examined how news media in eight um, Canadian communities covered the local race for member of parliament in the 2015 election. So just to look first at the local news map, it's crowdsourced and it allows contributors to add information about changes. So that could be the launch of a new local news outlet, the closing down of a newspaper or TV station, service increases or service reductions. Anything that affects local online, online broadcast or uh, print news media. What does, the map, what does the map tell us? Well, we tracked the changes going back to 2008, and as of the 1st of October, we have um, uh, almost 500 markers on, on the map. And basically, they tell a pretty powerful and disturbing story of newsroom closed uh, shutdowns that far exceed the number of new ventures. So more than two-thirds of the markers are, are pretty much bad news. So there's 260, that's the, the blue section, um, uh, representing the closing of local news outlets in 190 communities. Uh, included in that is 109 community newspapers. Another 66 markers, that's the green section, point to service reductions. So that might be a daily newspaper that turns, becomes a weekly, or the shortening of, say, a TV newscast. By comparison, there were only 93 markers um, on the map indicating the launch of new local news outlets. And just 42 of those um, were online news sites. Uh, and those are the ones we've, I've just shown you on this map. So I think we are missing some online news sites and that we don't have them all, but you know, even if, even if we've, you double the number, I think the trend is pretty clear that digital alternatives are not springing up fast enough to fill the gaps left by the loss of traditional news media. Um, and just um, FYI, if you're interested in seeing um, the map data, we, have, we produce summaries now that we're publishing every two months uh, along with the raw data as of the 1st of October, for instance. Okay, the second uh, news poverty related project I wanted to talk today uh, about today um, directly addresses the extent to which one particular critical information need in particular, that is civic and political matters, um, is being addressed. So to get at this, um, we examined how local news outlets in eight different places covered uh, the race for member of parliament back in the 2015 election. And what we found were big differences across the country, and that's what I'm going to touch on in the next few slides. So first, we found significant variations in the number of local news outlets per 10,000 registered voters in, in each of these eight places. So uh, voters in Brampton uh, there were, ha had only three uh, local news outlets and they were the most poorly served. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, voters in Kamloops had access to, uh, to news from nine local news outlets. Then we uh, looked at what the content was produced by those uh, news outlets and how much did they actually cover the local races for member of parliament. Uh, and again, we found differences depending on where you lived. Brampton and Oakville, which are two suburban uh, ridings, uh, two suburban communities, um, people in those ridings had the least access to news about the local race for member of parliament, along with the rural riding of City of Kawartha Lakes, which is uh, in the Peterborough area. So these are number of news stories per 10,000 uh, electors. Um, I should just point out that there have been a few changes since we did this analysis. Um, uh, in Brampton, there's actually just recently been launched a new online investigative news uh, uh, online site, which is good news. 
Less encouraging, however, is that the situation's deteriorated in other places. So in Nanaimo, the Nanaimo Daily News, uh, which published uh, about half of all the local coverage of the election in 2015 has closed down. So has um, in Kamloops, a digital news site, newscamloops.ca, uh, uh, which published about a quarter of all their coverage of the election has also um, shuttered. So I mention this because now when people ask about or talk about how difficult it is to know what's actually lost when a local news operation shut down, shuts down, we at least have this kind of data that we can point to. Okay, the final measure um, I'll talk about today is the extent to which people had access to a variety of news sources uh, to choose from uh, in terms of their election news and, and the local race. To do this, we borrowed an index from economics um, to measure media concentration. Um, so the closer the number is to zero, uh, on this chart, the more one single news outlet dominated the coverage. So Brampton had the least diversity of news uh, sources supplying the uh, people in, the, in, that, in those writings. Uh, it's kind of hard to ex get a, your head around, so I, I think this, it's, this does a better example than me trying to explain the, um, what is it, the Hirsch, herfindel hirschman Index. Basically what you see here is that in Brampton, although there were three news outlets, the Brampton Guardian did all the heavy lifting, producing 43 of the 44 stories uh, in, the, in the month prior to the election. So people living in Brampton really had only one source of news about the election, even though there were three media outlets there. By comparison, a place like Kamloops had, as I said earlier, nine local news outlets, uh, including a weekly newspaper uh, that provided 43 stories, uh, online news site, that's the one that closed, that offered up 36, and local TV. Uh, voters there had more access to vi a diverse range of uh, media sources and opinions. So to summarize, what we found was that by all three measures, the number of news outlets and number of stories per 10,000 registered voters, and the extent of news source diversity, the two suburban ridings, Oakville and Brampton, were the most poorly served, as was the rural, riding of, rural area of um, the city of Kawartha Lakes. Um, there was also considerable variation in the availability of political news among the small and medium-sized cities, and our conclusion is that where you live was a major factor in how much election news you could access back in 2015. So I want to just uh, finish off with a couple of points. Um, a recent uh, news survey, Vivid Data Trust in News Survey, um, looked at the relationship between Canadian news audiences and the news media. And actually what they found, and I think this is disturbing, that only... Um, uh, that local newspapers aren't actually doing all that well in terms of earning audience trust. They rank after national news, news sources, um, um, for instance, uh, and only about 66 placed a lot of trust in their local papers. Uh, and the, as I say, fall behind national newspapers and other uh, traditional media. So what does this tell us? I think it reflects the cost cutting we're seeing across the board that, that, um, um, that's leaving us with uh, newspapers that are sort of pale imitations of what they should be. And I'm not one to idealize the past and think that you know, all newspapers used to be wonderful and responsible and do a great job of covering their communities. But no matter where you look today, newsrooms are smaller and they have, in many cases, skeletal um, uh, reporting staff. Um, in the U.S., there's just a new report that came out with, I thought, a brilliant term for this. She, was, she called them, um, it's this prof called Abernathy at the University of North Carolina, ghost newspapers. So they, they publish, but what's in them, um, people are just aren't getting the news they need um, to uh, navigate their, their life in, in local communities. Now, I just don't want to end on a really negative note, so I thought I'd include this. Uh, which uh, is from the same survey, and it found that people actually still really care about local news more than any other type of news. So clearly there's a desire for independently produced, timely, verified, transparently reported local journalism. The question is, how do we meet that need? Well, I was thinking about this um, at a talk I did recently about innovation and the need for innovation in journalism to address some of these challenges, and I thought we really need to break it down into three parts. Um, the first it problem we need to solve is the financial viability of local news organizations. And that's a real problem. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But solving the business model doesn't necessarily mean local news is going to be widely available to the, to the widest possible audience. We also need to think about how we ensure that the critical information needs of the broadest possible group of citizens are addressed so that they can function effectively in a democratic society. And then there's a third issue, which is, you know, you can't just count the number of news stories. You also have to think about the quality of journalism produced. Um, so, you know, there are solutions out there in business models that maybe are going to make some money, but they're not necessarily going to make basic news widely available. Um, so they need to go beyond he said, she said uh, journalism. Um, 
Well, so far, nobody's come up with a single solution that's going to address all of these challenges I've listed up here. Um, but, there are, but there are experiments underway that give me some hope, um, a little bit of hope, I should say. <laughs> News organizations are experimenting with alternative uh, uh, revenue sources. And the federal government's trying to figure out how to spend the uh, 50 million that it's allocated to bolster local news over the next five years. So it's looking at reviewing the laws governing uh, foundation giving to um, news, news organizations. It's looking at tax changes um, that would make it more expensive for advertisers to advertise on Google and Facebook rather than local news sources. Um, so these are some of the ideas that are floating around. No single one of them, I think, is a silver bullet, but I do think um, that we can maybe explore some of these in a discussion to come. Thank you. Thanks very much. What an interesting uh, discussion. I have to say that I uh, always uh, make it a really important point to students that virtually all news is local. All news happens to somebody somewhere. And a lot of people out there don't really understand that. They think it's created on some kind of ethereal basis. But if you're not on the street, you're not in your own town, you don't really know where the news comes from and how to get it out to people. So thank you very much for that, Professor Lindgren. Well, now it's my real pleasure to introduce our special guest uh, for today, all the way from Boston, Mass., uh, who has come to uh, give us a really important talk, I think. Joshua Benton is the director of the Neiman Journalism Lab, which I know many of you are familiar with. Um, he got that job about 10 years ago, his dream job, he told me, uh, after spending a year uh, at Harvard as a 2008 Neiman Fellow. Um, he comes, of course, like all of our speakers today, uh, from a background in journalism. He was a reporter with the Dallas Morning News, uh, where he did a lot of investigative work and won the Philip Meyer Journalism Award for that work. He's reported in over 10 countries. He's been a Pew Fellow in International Journalism and a three-time finalist for the Livingston Award for International Reporter. Uh, reporting. But best of all, he used to be a rock critic, which I think is great at the Toledo <laughs> Blade. So Josh comes to us today, if I can uh, say that, uh, he comes to us today to talk about the connection between trust in news and local news. And I think he's going to try and draw some of those uh, tangents together for us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as a, uh, as a Cajun from South Louisiana, whose ancestors were, of course, kicked out of your fine country in 1755, it's always good to be back in Canada. And uh, I thought it would be uh, good to start this off with, in the most Canadian way possible, which is with this man, Harold Innes. Uh, I, the, the knowing sounds that just came out of the audience indicates many of you had to learn about Harold Innes. Uh, Harold Innes was one of the great thinkers uh, uh, of Canadian intellectual history, uh, a real scholar of political economy and a scholar of communications. Um, who did a lot of important work on the ways in which the physical landscape of Canada and the economic products that come out of it influence uh, political culture, political economy. Later on in his career, uh, right not long before he passed away in 1952, he published this book, Empire and Communications, which was overall an examination of the ways in which new forms of communications technology impact the ways in which empires either rise or fall. And the one important distinction he made was he, di he distinguished between what he called time-biased media and space-biased media. Now, of course, time and space happen to us all. But nonetheless, uh, time-biased media is what was something that is meant to be durable, something like a stone tablet, a book that might be read 50 years from now, as, as Empire and Communication still is, a public monument, something for which the creation of the, the piece of media was meant to connect a past and a, and a present and a future in some important way. What he called space-biased media was something that was much more ephemeral, a daily newspaper that is not going to be read much uh, you know, as soon as the, the, the sun comes up again a TV live broadcast, a radio broadcast. These are things that are mostly about where your location, are you in the right place at the right time to be watching television? Are you in the right place to be reading a certain city's newspaper? And time is, is very much of the essence. He uh, complained uh, at, in the middle of the 20th century about the ways in which newspapers and radio and television were creating the plague of present-mindedness. Um, their entrenched positions involve a continuous, systematic, ruthless destruction of elements of permanence essential to cultural activity. Harold Ennis was not messing around. Um, I think this is a, an interesting 
framework that was then later, of course, advanced by his younger colleague at the University of, of Toronto, Marshall McLuhan, who reframed it a bit as the medium is the message. The form in which the, the communication occurs is a very important uh, influence on the content of that communication. And if you want to take that highfalutin academic language and put it in something more concrete, news is a distribution business. The way in which the news gets from its producer to its consumer is incredibly important in shaping that news. And if I have one thesis for you today, it is this, that the technology of the 20th century uh, media distribution technology was, I'm sorry, technology twice there, was, an un, was a huge unspoken subsidy for local news. The ways in which news was created and distributed gave an enormous boost to local news that would not have happened in other environments. And now in the 21st century with digital distribution, that subsidy has gone away. So like Harold Innes, let's first start by thinking about the size of the North American continent. Uh, the fact that it is so darn big had very important influences on a whole host of things that Innes and others have written about. But one of them was media. Think about the, the United Kingdom where they have 13 national daily newspapers every single day, each of which has identified a particular niche audience. There's the upmarket liberal paper and the upmarket conservative paper and the mid-market tabloid and the downmarket liberal tabloid. Each one has figured out their own niche and because the UK is a relatively compact place geographically, you can get these papers all over. That encourages people uh, who want to start a newspaper to identify a particular ideological or, or otherwise market that they're trying to reach. In the US and in Canada, it was exactly the opposite. We did not develop, just because we were too big, that we did not develop large national newspapers that were in competition with each other and distributed uh, from Vancouver to, to Halifax. Sorry to the Newfoundlanders, I forgot. Um, that also meant that uh, United States and Canadian uh, newspapers were very dependent on advertising because they often had very strong local monopolies in their market. Uh, once you get outside of Toronto, you often would, would get to a lot of cities that have one newspaper. Um, they would have, appeal to a mass audience and make up their money through advertising rather than demanding more money from readers. That was very different from what happened in Europe. This is a chart that shows how a typical American newspaper spent its money before the web came along. Now, there are a few things that are interesting about this to me. You'll notice that the red slice uh, for editorial, that's paying all the reporters and all the editors and all the photographers and all the graphic artists. That's the actual news creation. It's only 14% of the entire package. But if you look at the three slices on the, on the right-hand side, production, distribution, and raw materials, those altogether are about half of the entire uh, cost structure. So they, when I say news is a distribution business, I, I mean that that's absolutely core to a newspaper's ability to fend off competition. They own the printing presses and you don't, and printing presses are expensive. And it meant that uh, when the internet came along, a lot of publishers looked at this chart and said, hey, maybe the internet, which essentially eliminates the cost of distribution, not quite eliminates it, but pretty much eliminates it, uh, maybe we might just be able to cut half of our cost structure and everything will be fine, and we'll continue to be incredibly profitable businesses, which newspapers were during the 20th century. That, as it happened, did not turn out to be true. This is instead what happened to American uh, print newspaper advertising revenue. Um, one thing you'll notice there is that it, it's, a, it's a relatively curvy graph, even before the internet comes in to be a big factor. That's because newspapers were very reliant on economic conditions. When times are good, advertising budgets go up and newspapers do very well. When times are bad, advertising budgets get cut and newspapers suffer more. So they were, much, they were not a, a steady state industry. But you notice the rise up to uh, the dot-com uh, crash, then a little, bit, a little bit more in the mid-2000s, and then with the financial crisis and, and what came after it, just total collapse from about over $65 billion a year to about $15 billion a year in the space of less than a decade. Uh, the industry association that used to report this number actually stopped doing it at the end of this chart because I think they were just getting very depressed. But it's probably under $10 billion at this point. You can see that uh, these are a few n newspaper chains in the United States, the UK, and Canada. And this is just from the most recent uh, quarter how much their print advertising revenue had declined. So McClatchy down 26%, Post Media down 15% from, from a year ago. Print is not coming back. Ad print advertisers 
have too many other choices. The reason why we had this enormous decline is not because people stopped reading newspapers. Newspaper circulation has gone down, but not to anywhere near the same extent as the advertising piece. It's simply that advertisers now, if they wanted to reach people in Kansas City, Missouri, they had one real choice, the Kansas City Star. Now they have an infinite number of choices, and that has lowered the, the price that they can get. So one impact of this has been this formerly very localized industry with one big newspaper in every city that made a lot of money and did a lot of good journalism. That localization has turned into nationalization. So just as, a, as an example, this is comparing the Seattle Times and the Seattle Post Intelligencer, which is no longer with us, the newspapers in Seattle versus the New York Times. So if you look at the year 2000, at that point, the New York Times circulation was about twice as large as the Seattle newspaper circulation. In the year 2000, if you wanted to read the New York Times, it really helped if you were in New York. Uh, it did not, was distributed to a certain degree nationally, but uh, by no means uh, everywhere. But, you know, Seattle is, is a little around half the size of, of New York. It's not outrageous that this would be the, the, the sort of comparison you'd have. In 2018, though, look at the digital subscription numbers for these two newspapers. The Seattle Times very proudly a few months ago announced we finally reached 36,000 digital subscribers, while the New York Times has 2.9 million. Again, there are lots of people who would, would want an alternative to the Seattle Times who lived in Seattle, but they just couldn't get one. There wasn't an alternative easily accessible. And there are always a lot of people who would have liked to be reading the New York Times, but they couldn't get it. Digital distribution completely shifted the power relationship there. And this is another look at the same pairs, but in, this, in the newsrooms. In 2004, the New York Times newsroom had about 1,200 people in it. The Seattle Times had about 375. If you fast forward to 2018, you can see the gap is yawning from a 3 to 1 ratio to an 8 to 1 ratio. Now, Seattle is a big market, a very wealthy market, but uh, so it may not be easy to see the connections between this and a small Canadian city, but this same nationalization of media interest has impacted metro newspapers and local newspapers as well. Uh, this is uh, one, one impact of this is that some people thought when the internet came along that because you can publish from anywhere that it might open up the geographic space that uh, people would be able to go live on the beach and write from the beach and publish from the beach. Uh, what has instead happened is that digital content producers, journalists, are far more concentrated in New York City and in D uh, Washington DC than television or radio or newspaper employees were. This analysis that I did not too long ago found that of all the posted uh, television and newspaper jobs in America, about eight to 10% were located in New York or DC. But for digital jobs, it was about 40%. And that ratio has actually grown in the time since then. So all the money that has gone into digital news and digital media, and there has been a lot of it, uh, has gone to digital startups that are trying to achieve significant scale. I mean, think about it. The reason why you might have wanted to start a newspaper that covered Hartford, Connecticut, is because you have the technology and the distribution methods to cover Hartford, Connecticut. If you're publishing online, what's the financial incentive to only write about something that's of interest to 0.1% of the world's population? So all these companies have decided that they need to target demographics and psychographics rather than geography. Uh, this is one of the, the, the difficult things about this transition. It just so happens that our our governmental system is based on geography. We have cities, we have mayors, we have city councils, we have governors, you have premiers. Um, that connection between geography and the media that was then covering the, those, uh, the, the politicians who are, and the governmental institutions is sort of broken by, by digital. One, one other impact is that it's become so much more important to have very specific data about your users, your customers, your readers. If you think back to what newspapers knew about their, their subscribers, it wasn't very much. You know, they had their address because they had to know where to, where to go to deliver the paper, um, but they didn't know if you only read the sports section. They didn't know if there was this one comic that you would immediately cancel your subscription if it was pulled out. They didn't know if, if, uh, if you spent all your time reading the stock quotes or whether you just wanted the movie listings. They had no insight into you as a customer beyond some broad demographic data that they could purchase from, from a consultant. Now, as it happens, uh, a man by the name of Mark Zuckerberg, uh, uh, Harvard dropout you may have heard of, uh, figured out ways to gather up enormous amounts of data about people. And once you shift from an environment where you're targeting people by geography, 
I mean, the Toronto Star knows that their readers their print, of their print newspaper are in Toronto. So if you're a Toronto department store, it made sense to, to go that route. Once you're focusing on data, though, Facebook and Google, these two companies that know everything about you, <laughs> that know everyone you know, the places you've lived, the content you like, all the websites you visit, uh, what you've ever searched for in a moment of panic at 2.30 in the morning, uh, what apps are on your Android phone, every location you've searched for in Google Maps, every video you've watched on YouTube, they have all this information and they have it across all your devices and across all the years you've been using their services. And that is an incredibly powerful engine for targeting advertising. And the result has been that 70% uh, of all digital advertising in the United States it now goes to those two companies, Google and Facebook. Even more astoundingly, if you only look at mobile advertising, advertising that comes on our phones, if you look at the entire world, excluding China, China's got its own different internet, if you look at the entire world other than China, Google and Facebook uh, take in around 75% of all mobile digital advertising. Now that leaves 25%, not just, it's not like the other 25% goes to the Toronto Star. The other 25% goes to Twitter and to LinkedIn and to Microsoft and to Amazon. Uh, when you get to actual news producing publishers, it's pretty, pretty far down the list. Then you add on one extra layer of disruption. Uh, you may have seen this famous pairing of photos, but uh, these are photos from uh, the announcement of Pope Benedict in uh, 2005 and of the announcement of Pope Francis in 2013. I think it's actually still really easy to underestimate the impact that these devices have had on every step of our lives. And this is a nice visual demonstration. You see the nice gentleman in the 2005 photo in the bottom right with a little flip phone. He's, <laughs> he's, he's doing what he can. <laughs> so when we switch from laptops to phones, uh, some people thought, well, hey, it's just the same thing, just on a smaller screen. But that's not exactly right, because when you go to the, switch to phones, you are trading in the open web for a closed app ecosystem. Uh, less than one out of every six minutes people spend on their phones is spent in the web browser, in Safari or Chrome. Instead, they are spending it inside Facebook, inside Twitter, inside the social networks and social platforms that were really incentivized by the shift to mobile. And when that happens, you're no longer, if you start a, news, a new website, you're no longer just one website among every website. Whether you were going to the New York Times or Amazon.com or Joe's blog about westernontario.org, .ca. Um, those were all just URLs that you could type into your web browser. They lived as equal democratic citizens of, of your browser tabs. Instead, on phones, we hand over the responsibility of figuring out what we want to watch next or what we want to see next to our social networks. This is a quote from a New York Times story some years ago that uh, it's just a regular old New York Times story, but this one line in it uh, has really stood out for a lot of people for a number of years. It's a woman who was conducting a focus group uh, of college students, uh, asking them about their news consumption habits, and the, the person said, the college student said, if the news is that important, it will find me, which implies a sort of horrific vision of news being this monster that sneaks up behind you and taps you on the, on the shoulder. But, this is essentially a, one piece of evidence about the grand de-ritualization of news consumption. You, reading a newspaper was something you did every day, at the same time every day. Watching a television newscast was something that you scheduled your days around. You sat down at 6.30 in front of the, the television to watch Walter Cronkite or Peter Bansbridge or whoever it may be. Um, now news in the digital context is just something that sneaks into your day every so often. If you don't make a, a conscious effort to seek it out, and most Americans and most Canadians don't make much of a conscious effort to seek it out, um, you might not get anything. And maybe you assume that if the news is that important, it'll find you somehow. Now, there are a number of local companies uh, who, are trying, who are doing innovative and interesting things in the local news space, which is clearly at, at great risk. These are a few of them. New the New Tropic in Miami, Billy Penn in Philadelphia the Charlotte Agenda in, you'll never guess it, Charlotte, North Carolina. And there are trade associations like the Institute for Nonprofit News and Lion Publishers who are, you know, places that a lot of smart people who are trying to do very good work um, are, are doing very good work. But it's at nothing like the scale that we would need, um, as we just heard, the, to replace what we are in the process of losing uh, from traditional media. So how have newspapers reacted to all these, these turns of events? 
Uh, well, they've consolidated. Certainly you in Canada know a lot about uh, the consolidation that your major newspaper chains have been engaging in in recent years. Um, we're seeing the same thing in, in the United States at a somewhat slower pace than you are, but um, there's day cutting, seven day newspapers becoming six day newspapers, becoming three day newspapers. Um, a model that uh, actually Canada has been a little bit ahead of the United States on. You've had more aggressive use of that uh, than we've seen in the U.S., although the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette in, in Pennsylvania just announced that they're going to be cutting back to, I believe, three days a week. And you have what I broadly put under the rubric of financialization. Newspaper owners uh, were generally newspaper people. Now, there were, there's the old halcyon days of family ownership that everyone likes to think back on, even though some families weren't so good. Uh, then chains buy them up, they get turned into corporate media, but for the most part it was still newspaper people who were owning them. Uh, now increasingly you have a large number of private equity firms and other vulture funds that are buying up lots of newspapers because they still throw off consistent cash flow if you just fire another 10% of the staff every year. And they are just writing these newspapers into the ground. Um, the largest chains in the, in the United States, uh, uh, several of the, of the largest chains in the United States are owned by faceless uh, uh, money men who have no interest in the civic role of newspapers. So I have Harold Innes looking at us uh, here. Uh, so you, you can see this transition. In newspapers you go from local dailies being dominant to the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, national brands that are good at producing news of national interest. In radio, you have live local broadcasting giving way, and at least to a certain degree, radio is still doing relatively okay, but to podcasts. The idea that you can have your personalized choice of, of the kind of content that you want coming into your earbuds, and you can figure out the time that you want it to, to come on. And in television, we went from local news being really important, live local news in, in the vast majority of cases, to cable news, which meant that people who really like news can go watch CNN all day long, and people who aren't interested in news can just go watch Bravo or whatever they want. And now to Netflix, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. So one thing I think is a, a common misperception about news uh, and this transition to digital is that we talk about how digital gives us much more access to news, and that is true. But it also gives us much more access to everything else. And that means that increasingly people are having to make a choice about whether or not to pursue news or not. And a whole lot of people aren't. They're happy paying, playing Candy Crush or checking Facebook. So let's talk about television briefly in the time that we have remaining. Uh, this is a, a kind of alarming chart if you're in the television business. This is for 18 to 24 year olds in the United States, so young people. And it's a kind of a confusing chart, but just look at the, the left line. That is the number of hours that a typical 18 to 24 year old American spent watching traditional television in 2011 through 2017. And you'll notice that in that short span of just a few years, they went from 26 and a half hours a week to 14 and a half hours a week. And I was able to have and paste in there the, a new updated number for 2018 down to 12.6 hours. So since 2011, half of television viewing has disappeared for young people. Um, now I'm, I will note this is traditional television, which in this calculation is watching regular television the way that I did as a child, uh, as well as using DVR, the DVR to watch something uh, the next day or, or later. But what it doesn't include is Netflix. What it doesn't include is, is streaming services, which are taking an ever larger chunk of people's attention. And there's a real question about what role news plays in this universe. Local television focused on news, local news, because it made sense. That was their market, that if you want to get people to tune in for a time, local news will at a set time so you can show them ads from local furniture stores. Local news is a great way to do it. But again, when the technological shift to streaming, what interest does Netflix have in news? This was a story that, that uh, came out in March in Marketplace, uh, saying, or in uh, Market Watch, excuse me, saying that Netflix was poised to enter the TV news business. And a lot of us were very excited by this, but very quickly, uh, the chief content officer, Ted Sarando, said, oh, just to be clear, no, we are not at all interested in news. Because the, the construction of, of, of value for Netflix is not, let's create something very expensive that is incredibly localized, we'd have to do it in every city across a, a country, and let's do it in a way that no one will ever care about it 24 hours from now. That's what news did, because that was based on the, the formats that we had to distribute in. Back to our, our friend Harold Innes. Uh, if you think about time-biased media, 
it's not just stone tablets and books and public monuments, it's also Netflix. Netflix is interested in, in creating high quality material and it's gonna have a very long shelf life that will be of interest to people in Canada and in the United States and in New Zealand and Zimbabwe and Russia and the 100 plus countries in which they're operating. News doesn't really fit into that at all. So to, to finish up, what is working? Um, not a lot, if I'm being honest, but you know, I have to try to end on a happy note too. Um, the big trend is charging people money. Um, the old model, mass media, was very reliant on advertising. That was how we paid the bills. Increasingly, as that disappears, newspapers are realizing they need to go to their readers and say, you gotta pay up. The idea of free content for, that is ex relatively expensive to produce and has a limited potential addressable market, um, people are gonna have to pay for it. Uh, the New York Times, uh, not uh, earlier this year, issued a sort of statement of purpose for the future, their 2020 plan. And this was the most important line in it. We are, in the simplest terms, a subscription first business. The New York Times wants to make someone like them enough that they get angry when they get to the paywall and they decide to pony up 15 bucks a month. That is their goal. And the New York Times produces a wonderful product and they'll be able to do it. Uh, as this is data from a number of countries showing that there is an increasing interest and willingness to pay for online news across lots of countries. Um, Mr. Trump has a significant part in the U.S.'s increase there. Um, this is uh, similar data. You'll notice uh, Canada's not faring all that well down there, down at 9% versus the, the U.S.'s 16%, one of the rare uh, measures in which you could argue Americans are more civic-minded <laughs> about anything than Canadians. But um, this is also an area uh, where you see pretty significant variations among countries, and um, not just among countries, but among the kinds of people who are paying the bills. Um, before, in, in 2016, so before the Trump election was, was concluded, liberals were about twice as likely to want to spend for online news as conservatives. After the election, it's now three and a half times more likely. This audience that, that you're reaching out to when you're charging is disproportionately well-off, disproportionately educated, disproportionately liberal, and it's not a perfect reflection of America or Canada. And again, the, the locals are having a real struggle there. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post all have millions of people who are, who are paying to access them. These are the top local newspapers in the country, the LA Times, the Boston Globe, Minneapolis Star Tribune, and a whole lot of other papers that are in the four digits, are in the five digits. Quality, quality local news is really becoming a niche product. Other things that work very quickly, because I know I'm, I'm running short on time. Uh, philanthropy, the United States is, is lucky to have a, a well-developed uh, system of foundations and, and philanthropy that has funded a lot of interesting and good nonprofit news organizations. Uh, you see the ones on the left there are the ones that are focused on specific geographic areas. One of the top right are ProPublica, large uh, national uh, investigative units, and down uh, the area of growth most recently is uh, news organizations that are focused on specific subject matter, covering education, covering criminal justice, covering health. But philanthropic wealth is wildly uneven. Some cities have a lot of it, some cities don't. Um, and that's just cities when you get down to smaller towns, the economic model falls apart much more quickly. Uh, for me to find a nonprofit news site from my hometown in South Louisiana, I'd have to be driving for quite a while. Memberships. This is sort of a twist on the subscription model, the idea that you're not just charging money for content, but you're also you're creating something that is closer to a public radio membership model in the United States or something like a club. This means you emphasize events, you all emphasize premium email newsletters, you, you emphasize podcasts, things that create a direct connection between the, the publisher and the consumer. Um, the, there's a lot of interesting work being done here, and I think this is an area that a lot of local news organizations should probably be transitioning towards. There's public media, of course, in the, in the UK, the BBC has decided to take some of its money to fund what they call local democracy reporters. These are reporters who are paid by the BBC but who work in local communities covering city hall, council meetings, that sort of thing, and their work product goes into local newspapers. It's essentially a way for the BBC to, instead of be viewed as a competitor to local news organizations, to be a supplier without any cost to the, the newspaper. And that's a, a very good and interesting initiative. It also helps to just have a really rich owner. And 
a number of news outlets have gotten those uh, lately. There, Patrick Soon Shang just bought the LA Times a few months ago. Jeff Bezos, of course, famously bought the Washington Post. Pierre Omidyar has put his own money to starting new news organizations. Um, and uh, Lorraine Powell Jobs, Steve Jobs' widow, has, been, has bought the Atlantic and is buying a, a number of other, making a number of other investments in media. But again, there are only so many bitch, uh, billionaires out there. What are some things that could help, finally? Government regulation. This is an area I'm particularly interested in, the area of video television. Um, when television licenses were first being issued in the, in the United States in a structured way around the time of World War II, the Federal Communications Commission made it a requirement that if you wanted to, as a private company, have a license to produce uh, to content that was going to go over public airwaves, there it was required that you were going to produce a certain amount of news and local civic content. It was part of the deal. Uh, I would argue that there is room for Netflix and Amazon Prime to be asked by regulators to make a similar commitment. If uh, Netflix wants to be in Canada, they should be required to take some of that enormous $8 billion a year they are spending on content and spend it on civically useful content for Canada, not to give your Prime Minister any ideas. I think there's also room for a bigger role for operating system providers. Two companies, Apple and Google, control all of your phones. If they decided that they wanted you to get more news, they could decide that you should get more news. Uh, they've already done this in a number of ways with Apple News and, and Google News. Uh, Apple has, uh, has really sent a, sent a lot of news to its users who would not otherwise be seeking it out. Google recently, when they made a change to the new tab uh, uh, page in Google, on, in Google Chrome, they started showing news stories there, and immediately that became a huge driver of attention to news stories. I think they've got some role to play. But in the end, it's really got to be about relationships. The switch from mass media to something else, whatever this is, uh, means that you no longer can just be this abstract publisher or broadcaster. You have to have a direct relationship with, with your users. There are going to be fewer of them. There's really no way around that. Um, but you need to give them a reason to not just go to one of the other 10 trillion pages on the internet or not to just go back to Candy Crush or Facebook or wherever else they want to go. If you want to look at it from a pessimistic point of view, you could say, well, audience attention is going to continue to wander. There are a lot of people who are just checking out of news entirely. Journalists are going to be left with a niche audience, not the mass audience that needs civic information. And increasingly, products will be built for the rich and the influential who can afford to pay uh, for, for news and information, or who are inter of interest to advertisers who want to target them. The more optimistic spin is that advertising and platforms have led journalism to the lowest common denominator, to hell with them. Uh, advertising did a lot, uh, a lot of good for news, but it also skewed our products in a number of ways. And Lord knows the same thing is true of Facebook. There is an audience that is willing to pay for quality news, and journalists can serve them. We can figure out ways to serve them better. And really the pressure is on us to create something that, that people will feel is essential, or at least add some sort of concrete value to their lives. Thanks very much. Right now, please, um, questions from the audience. We've got a mic out there, and uh, there's a lot of material that we talked about. I'm sure you have some, some ideas. This is uh, for Josh, and I'm sorry, I forget your last name already. Uh, I'm a reporter at the London Free Press here in London, and I'm wondering, you didn't mention it, or have you studied, and there, is there any hope for uh, media companies to take the Facebook and Google model and collect data on their readers and sell that data, or use that data to market for the market in the same way Facebook and Google do? Uh, it's extremely difficult. Um, I, I say that because notice that it's not 10 companies that are really succeeding in this, it's two. So. Twitter and LinkedIn and other companies that have an enormous amount of data nonetheless don't have enough to be able to compete in a significant way with Facebook and Google. Aside from that, newspapers are, uh, I mean, to put it, to be straightforward, newspapers are just not good at doing that. <laughs> and it's unlikely they're suddenly become very good at it. Most newspapers don't require any form of registration. Um, so that means that they are not, uh, they, they have no idea other than an IP address who is, who is looking at a story. Um, and beyond that, a lot of what Facebook and Google get, it, the, what enables the targeting to be so effective and in many ways creepy, is that they're taking lots of information from lots of different products. 
So your YouTube viewing and your Gmailing and you know, your, your, your G chats and, and whatever else, your search, your search terms. I think it's unlikely that newspapers are going to be able to compete with that. Thanks. Hi, thank you to you all. Um, I'm a student in media and public interest, and I just have, so like all of you have mentioned um, how like it's a extremely difficult time for um, people who want to be journalists and also do like investigative journalist work instead of, you know, um, getting a job at Facebook or like Google. Um, so what are some suggestions you have for young graduates that are looking into the journalist world? Well, I mean, one of the things that we talk about is that the opportunity for innovation. So if you've got, like, the solution to the local news problem, there's a, an opportunity for you. There's definitely a need for it out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, that's right. We'll be partners. Um, but um, also, I think there's um, things you can think about um, working in news organizations that are open to collaborations, whether it's with freelance journalists or between news organizations, that there are opportunities there that I think can address... Um, at least on the investigative side, because nobody's, uh, you know, cash strap news organizations aren't doing it on their own. Um, so if you can pitch an idea that um, multiple news organizations are interested and can work out a, a collaborative approach to, that there are, there are some opportunities there. Um, so those would be a couple ideas of sort of things to think about going forward, you know, developing a collaborative network or, um, you know, maybe a f 10 freelancers that could work on a project is, I'm just off the top of my head, thinking that there might be opportunities there to think about. Um, I was at a talk a couple nights ago with Jay Rosen of New York University answered this question and um, he was very encouraging to the young people there and, but his idea was that you should find a niche, find a niche of something that you care passionately about, become an expert about and you know you're probably not going to get, have a highly successful revenue model but you can build something that people care about and that you care about too. It may not be I'll, I'll just add a couple things. One, um, I think it's very important to be very good at one thing or two things. I see a lot of people coming out of journalism school who are kind of eh, at like 15 things. Uh, it really helps, to st it helps you stand out if there's one thing that you are really, really strong in. Um, and, and aside from that, I think that it's uh, important to know that you need to be in an environment, a mental environment, to be ready to change. Um, you don't want to sort of come out of, I'm sure this is not the case at Western, but at some journalism schools, people sort of come out teaching, you know, talking the old time religion because their professors are preaching the same sorts of ideals that worked well for a previous media ecosystem. Um, there are very talented young people who are getting hired into newsrooms, but they are being hired in, in large part because they are expected to be change, change agents in a way that 23 year olds aren't often expected to. So that's just something I think to embrace. Hi, thank you very much for your talks, actually. Um, so I'm going to, so I spent five years in Australia, and one of the things when I went there, and that was at the end of, like, turn of the century, um, and I was shocked coming from, 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 from Canada, from um, Peterborough, actually, um, and, uh, but, but going to Toronto frequently, um, at the sort of richness of the print media culture in Australia at the time by comparison to Canada. So one of the questions I'm, I'm uh, thinking about is, are there places elsewhere in the world that do this better than we do? Uh, I certainly think that there are places that are in much better shape for a variety of reasons. Some of that is through their own conscious action. Some of it is luck. Um, one significant challenge that we in the United States face is that um, the English-speaking market of 600 million people is very attractive. It has enormous scale, so there are lots of people seeking to enter it. Um, I have uh, friends who work for news organizations in Sweden. They are lovely, talented people, but they do not face anywhere near the same sort of disruption and co competition that they do there. Um, there are certain places where media consumption cultures are just different. Uh, Germany, for example, is a place where print subscriptions have not really weakened at, at, to anywhere near the degree that they, they have here. I think the one thing that is the biggest difference, certainly from the U.S. and to a degree from Canada, is that there's a very strong connection between the 
size and audience and respect given to a strong public broadcaster. Um, that has a huge rollover effect on trust in media more broadly. It sort of allows the BBC, for example, to be the anchor at the center of the system that lets The Guardian go be a liberal paper and lets The Times go be a conservative paper. Um, that central anchoring role um, that is something that is hugely important and there's been lots of studies that show a direct correlation between the strength of the public broadcaster in a country and a whole other set of issues around civic health. Um, in Canada, you certainly have a fine public broadcaster, but one that is much less funded than its, Euro its European colleagues, and we in the United States have much even less. So um, that, I feel, is a main distinguishing factor. I don't know if you guys want to... I'll just mention a couple things about the public broadcasters, because I, I agree. I think it's an important determinant of, of sort of overall media... Well with opportunities for citizens to get information. Uh, and one of the things the research shows is that where there is, um, uh, that, that public broadcasters sp spend more time covering elections uh, and, and civic news. So that um, if you have a public broadcaster, you're going to have at least a, a core of that sort of reporting. Um, and the second is that the presence of a public broadcaster in a market tends to um, raise all boats in terms of uh, competition. So forcing the private sector to, to up its, um, its performance. I think that's about it. We're going to have to go. We've got a lot more to do today, so I, I hope you'll join me in thanking our fantastic speakers. Well, it's my pleasure now to introduce our, I uh, guess I could call it our local news panel. We brought together four distinguished journalists to talk, uh, as, again, as I said earlier, closer to the ground on community news and news in the local southwestern Ontario area, and I'm going to introduce them from left to right. So uh, right here is Mary Baxter. She's with TVO and her, their new hub project, which she will tell you more about shortly. Um, she actually operates out of this building, the FIMS building, and in partnership with the uh, journalism program, which is great for us. She is a frequent guest on, I'm sure you know it, The Agenda with Steve Pakin, one of my favorite uh, news shows, news and uh, information. Uh, Mary's been working in this area for more than 25 years as a journalist. She's won many awards, most recently the Ontario Library Association Media Award for a segment she did about um, the changing role of libraries on the agenda with Steve. So welcome, Mary. Uh, next is Bernard Graham. He's the executive producer of CBC London, uh, also a part of an initiative to roll out CBC out of Toronto and into the uh, Ontario environment. Um, the station on Dundas Street opened in 2017 and it offers both digital and radio content to the uh, people of London. Bernard has worked in the media for more than 30 years, most of it at CBC. He's also taught at Western, right here, and at Mount Royal University. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Heather Wright began her journalism career in radio, but has since gone on to become a uh, patron of print, which uh, is great for all of us. Uh, she worked in Owen Sound in Chatham, uh, eventually working for the Chatham Daily News. She has also been a, a freelancer working for the CBC and Sun Media for many years. And then she took the almost incredible step, which we're going to hear about, of opening a newspaper, The Independent of Petrolia and Central Lambton, and followed that up by purchasing another newspaper, The, Thames, the Thamesville Herald. Um, since their inception, the both papers have done well. The Independent and the Herald have won numerous awards. And The Independent was named the Canadian Community Newspaper's Best All-Around Newspaper in its class in 2018. She also received the prestigious Canadian Journalism Foundation's Jackman Award for excellence for her investigative reporting at those newspapers. So we look forward to hearing more about that. And last, but certainly not in any way least, is Randy Richmond, which may, who many of you will know in the London area. He uh, grew up in my hometown, Hamilton, which is great, uh, but really um, was born in London and came back to work here. He's worked in many places, Waterford, Ottawa, Toronto, Aurelia. He was with the Packet and Times, which is now closed apropos of our opening uh, list of newspapers that have disappeared. And he's been at the London Pre Free Press, as many of you know, since 1998. I have to say that I'm a fan of his work. He's been nominated many times for the National Newspaper Award. He's won numerous Ontario Newspaper Awards. He did win a National Newspaper Award as part of a team that covered the uh, terrible Tory Stafford kidnapping and murder, which many of you are familiar with. And most recently, he did a really tremendous piece of reporting on problems in the London jail system. And for that, he won one of the most prestigious awards in Canada, the Missioner, and uh, congratulations on that. Um, he's here to talk about what's happening at the London Free Press. So welcome, panel. Thank you. Um, 
I hope we can keep this fairly fluid. And I'm really just going to start, actually, I'm going to start with you, Mary, and ask you, the Hub is a, a project that you're a part of, and can you explain a little bit about how that's working for TVO and what it's trying to do? Okay. So TVO launched the Ontario Hubs in uh, 2017, so just, just last year. It feels like it's a little bit longer than that, actually. And the vision was to uh, hire reporters in the communities in which they were already working uh, throughout Ontario. So there's, there's four of us that are throughout Ontario, just basically the four quarters of the province. Um, and I'm based in southwestern Ontario. Uh, it's made, uh, we also have many others who are on the team. We have a, um, a, a video or, or broadcast reporter and, and host. Uh, and there's others, many others who are working behind the scenes as well. And uh, it was made possible by two, two components, actually. Uh, an amazing uh, donation uh, from the, the, the Green family. And you, you heard today that uh, they have uh, given us another donation to continue this, this work. Uh, but one thing I really wanted to, to highlight here was our uh, partnerships with the mm -hmm. universities and with programs like, like FIMS, which uh, is the way that I look at it is that's what makes hubs go. Okay. Uh, because there's this, this wonderful, uh, well, number one, they give us offices. So <laughs> as, as you heard, I've got an office here and it's a beautiful office. Uh, but uh, really key to it is there's, there's a, um, an internet um, service provider called Orion, which is a high-speed research network that uh, enables uh, you to feed high-quality video. I'm, I'm a print person, I'm not a broadcast person, so I don't know quite what the technological terms are. Yeah. But I just know that it can, it means that we're actually able to do um, what we call hits or file from, from here in London, for instance, or in Thunder Bay, uh, in Kingston, and uh, Sudbury. Those, that, those are the locations of our hubs. So the vision, just to talk a little bit about what yeah, the vision please. of it, because I, I, th I think when we're talking local news, uh, one of the things that we have to remember about the Ontario Hubs project is that we're looking at uh, local news through a provincial lens. And I mean that in two different ways. Number one, when you look at the vehicle at which we uh, deliver our information, it's, a, it's provincial. We've got a website that serves a provincial mm -hmm. audience, and that's what I do most of my writing for. I, I do a lot of uh, feature writing. And then the other aspect of it is when you look at a program like the agenda, well, it's broadcast, and it is also serving a provincial audience. So that really shapes how we're determine, determining and thinking about what we're covering. Uh, it, it means that we're, we're choosing with care. We're looking, we're looking at stories that uh, definitely represent what's happening in communities, but also that might have... Um, uh, there might be something that's happening here that has, uh, res holds resonance for other uh, communities across the province. And that becomes a part of our decision making when we're, we're looking at what types of stories. We're also looking at things like stories that will last. I think that's also uh, an important mm -hmm. component as well. So, um, because again, one of the, the other components of us with TVO is that uh, our, it's right in our mission station statement uh, that we are, we in, our basic reason d'etre is to inform and to educate. So uh, it's about promoting good uh, civic conversation uh, and, and venues to do that sort of thing. So again, that's shaping how we're, we're looking at that, that local coverage and, and bringing it onto the uh, provincial platform. Now, Bernard, I'm going to shift to you because I think there's a relationship here, but it might be in, in, in an inverse way. Um, you're part of the project where CBC decided to go into middle-sized communities. I know this because of Waterloo. Mm -hmm. Hamilton was on mm -hmm. the list, and we're part mm -hmm. of the digital movement. Uh, I suspect that you're not doing provincial. You're doing local. Can you talk about what that initiative was like and what your goals are? In it? Sure. It was, uh, it was something that the CBC embarked on uh, several years ago. It's called Local Service Extension. It's a strategy. And I think it's, it's founded on the idea that uh, uh, three things that, you know, um, you know, like municipal governments, people are closest to their local service. So um, that, you know, that um, 
uh, the idea that a local media outlet, a local CBC outlet, people could be closer to it and be more involved and more consuming of CBC content. Uh, secondly, um, the idea that the technology changed yeah. uh, to enable uh, the, the idea of local service extension. And third, it's, it's um, you know, the, the, the recognition that the, you know, a network is only as good as its regional structures and right. its local structures. So, um, so the CBC embarked on this. Um, and when you think about it, like in 2012, um, when South southwestern Ontario, southern Ontario was experiencing uh, explosive growth, yeah. there was CBC Toronto and CBC Windsor. Yeah. There was nothing in between as far as a station. So in, in, in order, it went Hamilton, right. then KW, and then uh, CBC London signed on about, uh, what is it now, 18 months ago. Right. So uh, that's, that's a manifestation of local service extension now. Um, and again, it made possible because, we, uh, because of technology. So one of the key things about CBC London, as mo many of these operations, it's focused on where the CBC audience was. So we knew it was radio, and we knew it was digital. Right. Less so television. Right. Television has been a shrinking uh, uh, audience for us, and at a time for many years where it was by far the most expensive platform. So you're probably not going to see CBC local or open up any local TV stations in the near future. That's just, that's just, that's just not on the agenda. It's just not right. on the agenda. You know, for, for stations like, uh, like Calgary, which I have a colleague uh, here, you know, TV used to take up like 75% of the operating yeah. budget and staff, right? So now that has kind of gone to the side. But the one thing I should point out is we're not in television, but we are in video. Right, of course. So we are still a video uh, offering service in that we, all our reporters and all our staff actually have iPhones as we're a news gathering uh, piece of equipment. We do, uh, we have a VJ, which we embed a lot of video into stories and we do uh, stories that are only published for Facebook now. Wow. And then we also have something called uh, a video system, so it's an automated video switching system that allows us to take our radio content, so the interviews from radio programs, and put them online. And you can see the video of those interviews or segments of them and that type of thing. So we are a, a digital uh, radio, but we're very much a video operation. Too. Like in the old days, we used to call that a two-way guy, and now, <laughs> nowadays everybody's a three- it's and four-way person. Yeah. Uh, and I think I'm going to jump to Randy because it, this really speaks to something that you mentioned uh, in our previous conversation. Um, one thing is you have new competitors in town, right, and you are really the, 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 the anchor of, of reporting in London. But you mentioned that you, uh, the whole newsroom, has moved to new ways of reporting. It's true, and we've, you know, we've had, we've been right in the center of the storm of technological changes and financial cuts, yeah. and it's no secret that we've been cut. Uh, back in staffing and resources at the same time that an onslaught of technology came and now competition has come and There's been lots of challenges and we've been battered a bit um, But I think it's actually all working now some of the waves are kind of working together. We've had to Refocus mm -hmm. we've had to become more flexible and more focused at the same time and the flexibility comes with the technology and the, f the fact that we can't do as much as we could before but we also have technology like the smart iPhones, basically, yeah. smartphones, everybody. So we can go out and we can do quick video, we can do quick reports, we can put stories online quickly. Unfortunately, then sometimes we just have to leave them. And we've had to focus on what's more important. We don't always do that. We always argue about it, as every newsroom does <laughs> all the time. Um, maybe not yours, because <laughs> you're in. But, um, you know, so we've had to focus on what's really important. And, and at the Free Press, uh, if there's a culture of that at the Free Press now that we have to focus on what's important. That's helped in part by competition. I have to say that yeah. you know the CBC and TVO coming here has helped us a lot. It's sharpened you guys up. And it's media. made. I, I like to think it's made our financial masters and our corporate masters realize that they can't just let us slide. Right. They have to give us mm -hmm. the ability to compete. Right. Um, we've had to take though because of the cuts. We've had to take a, a regional approach, and we've brought in people from the region into one big family right now, and, and there's some stresses. Uh, I have a colleague here uh, who can talk about those stresses. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we've had to do that. We have a regional web desk, we have a regional print desk, 
So everything's more centralized. The good part is that we can sometimes offer support to places, smaller papers that didn't have support before. And by that, I mean training and access to yes, technology. Yes, of course. Right. So it's been quite a ride. Uh, and, you know, we've done everything. We've tried to be part of uh, the old Sun TV network, and that didn't work out too well. We've tried many different things. What seems to be working is just maintaining a focus on good old-fashioned journalism yeah. delivered in different ways. Good local reporting and yeah. using the technology to bring it to people. Right. Well, speaking of a ride and disruption, um, you've managed to do something amazing, Heather, which is to start something new. And, and I mean, I, I'd like to think you're not insane. So, can you tell us why you think, why you decided decided to start newspapers uh, where other people have uh, not dared to go? Can you talk a bit about that? Well, it, part of it is insanity. I'm convinced of that <laughs> more and more every day. But um, a lot of it is what we were talking about about local news deserts. Yeah. The community that I was uh, that I live in, Petrolia. Um, had a local newspaper, but, pardon me, um, Post Media, Sun Media, all the former um, uh, owners had chopped away at it so much that what was happening in that local newspaper really didn't reflect that community anymore. It was frustrating. It was right. frustrating for me as a journalist. I wasn't working in a newsroom at that time. I was freelancing. Yeah. And it was amazing to me the stories that were not being told. Um, and as it happened, I had a conversation with someone about, uh, I guess it was 2013. Um, it wasn't Post at the time. I think it was Sun laid off 500 people all at once. I remember that. And a lot of my friends lost their jobs. Yeah. And I had lunch with the one guy, and I was commiserating with him. And I said, you know, I, I really feel for you. And I, you know what? He says, don't worry. I'm going to start a paper. And Daryl's going to start a paper up in Sarnia, and you should start one here. And I went, ha ha, you're funny. <laughs> And when I got home, Sun Media had cut my job in half as well. Wow. So then it became a little more of an idea in the back of my mind. And the interesting part was, um, as a reporter, I had no money to draw on. Yeah. So I went to members of the community and I said, this is what I want to do. And you know, these guys didn't know me. They, I wasn't reporting within that community, so I didn't really have a reputation there. Right. But they backed me financially wow. and without a whole lot of convincing because right. they recognized that they were in a they were having a difficult time because they didn't have local information right um, well and that leads, leads me to a good question Bernard do you think there's a hunger for local news I mean one of the things that's being discussed now is whether people have you know in some ways losing interest in their local community they're being serviced as we heard by Google and national uh, news you know Trump amuses us and horrifies us every day. That's enough to derange us for a little while. Um, you seem, CBC has doubled down on local. Can you talk about whether you think the people you're talking to in London, do they want something from you? Do they want Well, I think, uh, I think, uh, was it April's research? Um, you know, someone suggested that by far people still prefer local news. That's the top thing they look for. Right. And I think that's what uh, the recognition of the local surface extension was. Huge hunger. Uh, for news and information in this city, I think what's what's changing is the uh, the uh, you know ways to get it. Uh, not only the technology, but you know there's blogs and and there's you know um, all kinds of different uh, social media avenues to get information. So it's a it's a it's a bigger, perhaps more clouded ecosystem locally. But the hunger for local news, no doubt. No doubt. Eh? So can you talk a little bit about what are you trying to cover? Are you trying to cover? Um, City Hall? Are you trying to cover whatever crime is happening in Petrolia? I hope not much. Unfortunately, uh, there is crime in Petrolia. Are there controversies that, that bubble up and you, you um, well, get it, on them? Yeah. I mean, I am the only on-the-ground newspaper for about half of Lambton County. Wow. So I'm not only covering Petrolia, but there's like six other communities that I'm trying to follow the civic yeah, sure. portion of things. You know, there's a fire. I'm out in the middle of the night was talking to Kathy on the phone as I was chasing a fire truck the other day. You know, it's um, in community newspaper, you have what you used to have years ago where it was newspaper people running newspapers. Yeah. And they're a little, a bit of a different breed. Right. Um, profit is nice, but not necessary. Yeah. Um, and it's getting the story. So you, you work really hard. Um, and it has, it does make a difference. Um, this year, for example, 
um, the local CAO in Petrolia was buying properties and renting them back to the municipality, which is completely unethical, wow. but would have gone unnoticed if our paper had not been around because someone tipped me off yeah. and I was able to find out what was going on. The man's lost his job. There were criminal charges that were withdrawn after he made a deal. Um, and this municipal election has just been nuts. There's three candidates for mayor. There's, um, I think, 11 or 12 people running for council. And I believe it's because people are more engaged because there's a local newspaper on the ground that's actually reporting what's going on. And just to speak to that for a minute, because we heard uh, from April Lindgren about news deserts. So you're telling me that without you, this election would have gone on with no coverage of candidates and no stories about them? Um, it's possible, although the, there was a newspaper in town when I started. It right. has since closed, yeah. the, the historic Petrolia topic, yeah, unfortunately. Um, it may have, but there are other regional journalism outlets in our area that have given very, very little coverage to wow. these communities that I cover. Wow. <laughs> Randy, you talked about refocusing, so, uh, and I know that resources are slimmer and the number of bodies you have at LFP are, are smaller or fewer, I should say. Can you talk about what the focus is? What, what do you guys, in, your, in the morning meeting, what, what goes to the top of the agenda? Well, it's, it's, we have a kind of a, the two masters still, which is very difficult for, because we have the print side and the yeah. digital side. Yep. So there's always a balance between the two, although digital is winning the war for our hearts and minds as well as our pocketbooks. So we focus in the more we have kind of a, a loose division of labor in the morning for web, online. We're all responsible for, of course, web and online. But the focus has, um, and we chased everything as well. We chased, we kind of got into that chasing clicks thing. Yeah. That everybody kind of did for a while. So I, I found out the focus more is in the morning. As well. What are the stories that are important that day? Right. What? How are we going to hold people accountable? And, and it's not always that. Sometimes it's yeah. the crime we have to cover, or the municipal election has dominated our resources. Um, CBC's for the last three or four months, or three or four weeks, and so we still focus, try to focus on what's the most important to our. That, and I know that some people in social media may not like that. It's still we're still responsible for deciding what is key. Right. To cover and you're the gatekeepers still. To some still, extent. and you know, certainly social media um, talks to us about that. I mean, we all are on Twitter first thing in the morning and Facebook, but constantly, as we all are, yeah. all the time, seeing what people are talking about, and that will direct us as well. But there's still a, an element in the newsroom that is still what what do we de need to do to, to hold people accountable, hold institutions accountable, and make right. the city better. Right. And you know, it's still, and I think that's a culture that. You either have or you don't have, and that's that may be the most important thing any of our news organizations have, and I think we all do. Right, right, good. I can't figure out whether students are trying to break into the room or break out, but I, I guess we'll figure it out. Sorry, sure. If I can just jump in there. Please. I, I think what Randy said about um, social media is really important because um, we use social media as a tool to gauge what people are talking about as well. I, I'd love to disengage from social media some days. <laughs> I really would. Yeah. Cause I am so sick of Donald Trump and Doug Ford. But if I don't engage in social media, I don't know what my community is talking right. about. And, you know, it's a double edged sword. I use social media. I think uh, community newspapers have shied away from social media and the web because they're trying to protect their subscription base. Right. But I really see it as a tool to enhance our subscription base. Um, if people know you're producing good quality news and stuff they're not seeing anywhere else, and they know they're not going to see it all on social media. They're going to be driven to you eventually anyway. Right. So it's good for us as, as small newspapers to use social media to our advantage. Great. I just made, sorry, go ahead. No, no, was, jump in. I know um, we've watched CBC grow in London and sure. we've watched CBC grow in London. The print guy wrecked his mic. <laughs> <laughs> Shocker. Shocker. Um, and um, social media to sort of I hate to use the word brand, but brand ourselves. Yeah. We still want to brand ourselves, and now we want to brand who, what we represent. And I think, Bernard, if you can talk, we found that you guys have done an excellent job on social media of, you have a morning show as well, but sort of showing, introducing yourself to Londoners and connecting with Londoners really well. Um, I'm not sure how. 
Well, is that, is that the yeah, conscious can you speak effort? To how much that's a part of the well? The first, I want to buy Randy about twelve beers but, <laughs> um, for those kind of words. But uh, you know, it's it's all a part a part of the uh, you know the one good thing social media can sometimes do is is show the transparency. Yeah, right? it can show you how you're gathering your story or the person coming up who's sitting in the studio about ready to go with the headphones on or things like that. So we've been effective, I think, in using social media to pull back mm. the curtain a bit and. Certainly, transparency is something that we all want to do as the media outlets. And just to Go jump ahead. in there, yeah, you know, with, with TVO, social, social media is just incredibly important. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, I guess it was, uh, we started to introduce uh, the agenda on Periscope, for instance. Right. So it can live stream through uh, Twitter, and then, of course, you can also live stream it through, the, 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 uh, through Facebook. But uh, it's also, in terms of the Ontario Hubs project, it's just really important to get people talking across the regions right. as well and sharing information. And we're seeing that more and more, uh, those kinds of conversations, which is really exciting because, number one, it's kind of like getting away from being Toronto-centric, yeah, <laughs> which we were talking about earlier, about how there's such a concentration of media in Toronto, you know, and we're yeah. all trying to do our mm -hmm. bit out here. But then also, how do you get people in Ontario to think about the, you know, that they're they're a part of this province, you know, rather Absolutely. than going and that's through? That's a big part Toronto. of our jobs is trying to reflect London to the rest of the province yeah. and certainly the country. That's yeah, it, it's funny. I mean, Toronto is a tremendous magnet for media, and and we all look to it for media. And yet, you know, I know having talked to people in Toronto, London seems like a long way away, as though it's out in the wilderness. Um, but we're all so tied together. Hamilton's a vibrant community. Mm -hmm. London's a vibrant. Kitchener Waterloo is exploding, right? So I think this project that you're in charge of has really helped with that and, and helped make that come alive. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit in terms of um, revenue. So you do have a digital presence. I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah. With, yeah. And how how's that going? Are you making money with local advertisers who? Don't want to, you know, advertising on Google doesn't really work for the local plumber or the person who cuts down trees or whatever's well, part, happening in Petrolia? Part of it is um, demographics. Okay. So um, many of the people who are business owners in our area are of the demographic that still believes very strongly in newspaper. Right. So that works in our favor. Um, but it's also a really big tool to say, you know, these are dedicated people who buy this newspaper mm -hmm. every, every week and this is where they get their local news and if you want to catch the people that are driving by your store each day right. Facebook's not going to do that no, for you. No, right. So it's very powerful still to be able to be in the community. Um, so yeah, uh, for the first couple of years we were a, a free paper. Oh, okay. We uh, sent our paper 8,000 copies across the region right. and it just got too costly Yeah. and um, we went to a subscription base and you know, we turned that around in a fairly short order, and it's been really good. And That's we, remarkable. Yeah, it didn't. It was totally not planned, but it didn't hurt either that this whole CAO scandal happened about the time I was sure. going to subscription, and that helped with which made people see how yeah. important local journalism is. Well, talk to the New York Times. Trump's been the best exactly. thing that ever happened to them, exactly. right? Exactly. Randy, can I put you on the spot, and maybe you can answer or not answer? I don't know. Um, you know, we heard from Joshua that fully half of that circle uh, was was the production, the raw materials, and the delivery of the old-fashioned newspaper. I, right. I get to a day, I suspect, you know, you read in in the morning, um, we are not spring chickens, and so our time may be on the wane. What does the LFP think about print, and where is that balance now between print and digital for you guys? Well, I think it's uh, painfully clear um, that, you know, this talk about the print will eventually be gone. Mm. I almost hate to say it. I don't yeah. know when. Um, you know, we used to have a, a bit of dark humor at the newsroom when we were looking at our circulation figures. We Somebody calculated the year and the day that we down to zero. And <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. So There's a morbid soul. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the focus, you know, to be honest, is, is largely a lot on digital now. Yeah. Um, more and more so that way. Um, right. And of course, everybody knows the, the model for the print revenue, you know, an ad, I, I don't sell ads, so $2,000 ad is a $20 ad on digital, right? Of course, yeah. So the revenues have Dollars fallen. Dollars for dimes, right? Right. And, you know, I know that different papers and uh, within our chain, I think, have even, you know, toyed with subscription versus advertising. Um, 
paywalls, etc. Paywalls, and I the reason I asked the question earlier about marketing because I know that some chains are considering or hoping to gather information to market uh, to advertisers, but again, that's a, you know that's competing head on with Facebook and Google, what they're very good at. Yeah. So, but you know, it's it's clear that we are focused more on digital in a way. We still have a, a loyalty and there's still enough loyalty to the newspaper mm -hmm. that we still need to consider it. Um, for people like me who grew up with newspapers, I'm divided. Yeah. I mean, I've mentioned that, you know, uh, I love the, I love newsprint, but I love the re limitless space that online gives me. Don't all reporters. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we don't have to cut as much. Exactly. In fact, don't edit it at all. Just put it the way it is. Yeah. And, you know, so, but yeah, it, it's clear, you know, without getting into to numbers, which I don't know, we are definitely, you know, switching to digital company first. Absolutely. Yeah. Bernard, can you speak to that a little bit about, um, there's been a resurgence in, uh, we'll call it audio uh, for the sake mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, it's sort of interesting, right? The, one of the oldest mediums uh, mm -hmm. you used to listen to it in your car suddenly has got a, a been reborn as podcasting, but um, can you speak to the balance uh, between the digital offerings with your print and photo and uh, video product line, and then what people are responding to in terms of your on-air personalities and the morning yeah. show? And uh, So we are, uh, we are tasked with being a digital first station, uh, which is great, you know, that we have a website and, um, that, you know, we're at a place on the CBC's mobile app. But I can honestly tell you when we launched in London, no one ever came up to me and said, you know, so happy you have a website. <laughs> I'm so happy you're on digital. People loved radio, right? Like they were just like, I'm so excited that you know we're going to have a morning show uh, based in London and an afternoon show based in London for the region. So um, you know what I think we're trying to do is actually in some ways leverage radio and uh, to keep reminding people of the digital presence. Right. And uh, to push people to the digital. Yeah, presence. just yeah. to remind people. Okay. Yeah, to yeah. remind people. Yeah. And uh, you know, slowly build that uh, that digital audience because that was brand new. Yeah. And um, especially to CBC listeners, it really wasn't part of the ecosystem for them, the digital uh, offering. Well, it has. It has. It really has become that. Mm -hmm. And uh, CBC.ca is a powerful. Yeah, it's, it's massive. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, that's that's a whole platform that's being developed over you know the past twenty years. Mm -hmm. um, and that is certainly because there was no kind of increase in the, the government funding, so there's huge no, you have shift to take away money out. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, to develop that whole platform, yeah. which uh, I know hasn't been particularly popular in some areas, <laughs> you know. Uh, but um, uh, you know, we, we we are certainly still pr uh, digitally focused as right. a station, and I think as as a corporation. Wow, that's where the, that's where the audience lives now. Yeah, and the whole idea of broadcasting is, is you know, it's going to have to be redefined, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Mary, can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, obviously you have some um, uh, marquee people like Steve Pakin, and you really are, your TV, TVO is TV. Um, where's that balance for you guys, and, and what's really the emphasis out here for you? Well, it was interesting listening to Bernard, because one of the things that, that I would say is that broadcast itself has become digital. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, so that continually when you're doing something for broadcast, you're thinking about how do you parcel that out as components to be used on social media, for right. instance, that's something that we do, or, or on your website. Uh, there's, there's a lot of crossover uh, between our digital section and um, our broadcast section. To give you an example, uh, a little while ago, I did an article about <coughs> e-voting, mm. and um, this gets into the local thing. I started out in Stratford, and that's and it was interesting in Stratford because uh, they were the first city in the southwestern region to really adopt e-voting, and they've been doing it. This is their third third time round in the mini in uh, municipal elections. But I so I had a story that I was going to write for the website. But uh, as I was going through it, it became really apparent to us that there was um, a need here to go into it a bit more in depth and a bit more analyti analytically in terms of the, the subject experts on this. So we devised, uh, we worked on doing a segment on the agenda. So that's, that's the kind of crossover wow. we're, we're seeing. And yeah. it's, it's remarkably creative. And, and so then you've got it on two different venues. Um, I think another example of, of that is I, I, 
my colleague John Thompson, who is based in Thunder Bay, a while ago did, uh, quite a while ago now, I think, um, a piece about why uh, uh, First Nations kids are leaving Thunder Bay, that they would, might come to school yeah. to Thunder Bay, but yeah. they're, they're leaving um, for, for, for different issues. And then our uh, colleague, uh, J.N. Jagannathan, I went and did a video that was complementary to that, that could be distributed through social media and also aired on the agenda. So it's quite an interesting, um, broad kind of package. Right. I'm, I'm cognizant that we've got people here who I think would like to talk to the panel, so I'm just going to ask a quick question down here. Um, we haven't talked much about trust. Heather, you started something new. How did you esta establish trust? And then I think we'll open it up to the audience. I mean, people knew you, but here's this new paper that pops Actually, up. Actually, people didn't really know me, but they got to know me because yep. I still firmly believe that journalism is getting out of the office and being yeah. where the people are. Absolutely. And unfortunately, that's, that's not always the case in every medium anymore. Um, so I went everywhere. You just... I, I went to every single fair. I went to every single... And it's exhausting, but people come to know you. And they Absolutely. come to trust you. and they. Yeah. Um, like the star puts their reporters' bios on the bottom, but I write a column and everyone knows who my kids are and yeah. my dog's name is, and so they get to know you personally. So right. you become their neighbor, but you're their trusted neighbor, right. which is really a huge responsibility. Yeah. And it weighs really heavily on me a lot because I'm it. Yeah. yeah and absolutely. it's it's difficult sometimes, but you really... It's such an honor to, to yeah. be able to serve a community that way. Yeah. Before we go to the audience, actually, I just want to throw to you because um, you are a trusted name in the community. Can you speak a little bit about the LFP and trust? And Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same situation Heather has. There's a, a core of people there who have been a long time and, and built up a name. Um, we, as I've, there's been pushes to brand ourselves, which I resist because I have no idea what that You're not a product, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but I think that over time, you can build up trust. And you, obviously, you can build up quickly, but it, you're right. You have to be there on the ground, listening to people's stories and telling them fairly and accurately. And that's, it's a very, it's a simple formula that has worked. It doesn't work for all reporters in all new news organizations mm -hmm. or all news organizations. And there's lots of people who, with all of our organizations, think that we're full of that F word news. Yeah. And so... You know, I, but it's, it's just, I think it's just been over time and yeah. just sticking to our guns, those principles that were up on the screen. Absolutely, yeah, I know. You know I, I love seeing them up there in print again because I think it, it guides us all. And if it does guide you, you can still have trust with, with readers. With the readers, yeah. Good journalism builds trust. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, can I just of course raise that are. point there? Um, and I, someone mentioned it, the idea of uh, disinformation during the municipal campaign. And we've seen... We've seen some examples, and that's where uh, you know, good. You mean in London? In London. Wow. Yeah. Uh, one yeah, candidate. Yeah. Well, in London, yeah. the the one candidate who was uh, you know had material and talking about a BRT tax that it was going to add a thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollars to property tax, which was uh, patently false. Wow. But that was being spread around, and uh, you know that's when as a media outlet, you have to go out and do those stories and, you know, push on where do you get those numbers, and then you realize that there, there's nothing of substance there. So um, when you report that and show your, how you arrived at that, that is uh, a way to build that trust. Absolutely. People yeah. come to, that's important information for yes. people in London, and then there's a, a bond built there. Yeah, I mean, there is dis disinformation. It's, yeah, it's happening. Yeah. Yeah, We've got to realize that, and that's, that's where when we can expose that, that's where trust is built. Yeah. And just to jump in on that, again, that's uh, one of the motivating factors uh, of establishing the Ontario hubs was yeah. that, that concern about uh, trust and, and what kind of information was being disseminated. Do we have time for some questions? We've got five minutes, so let's make the most of it. You've got some tremendous people up here doing local news. Uh, please. Questions from the audience? All right, I'll ask a question. And actually, I'm probably going to put you on the spot, Paul. Oh, great, great. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've got, you know, what, two months left yeah, to embarrass yeah, that's you. Right. Yes. Go for it. Um, so one of the things that I've, I heard initially when I started at FIMS is 
Um, you know, as a journalism program or a journalism and communication program, we suffer in London, and the suffer is in quotation marks, um, because we're not in a major media we're not a major media center, mm -hmm. not like Toronto or Ottawa or Montreal, Vancouver. Yeah. Um, so what I'm wondering is how our program here, mm -hmm. right, um, sort of situated in a medium-sized city that is re experiencing a resurgence in, mm -hmm. in different forms of, of, of news, how, how that may actually work in our favor and work in the favor of our, the students that are coming out of here um, to still have that connection with local news. Thank God I can answer this question because yeah. we're live. All right. To, to that was a yeah. softball. Um, you know, it, I know Randy's going to agree with me completely when I say this. Um, I've told the students this forever, and there are students right here in the audience who will be able to back this up. I firmly believe that it's actually better to be in a middle-sized community than it is to be in Toronto when you're young, and especially when you're young and inexperienced. And the reason for that is there's great news everywhere, but middle-sized communities allow a young reporter the ability to get into the street to um, make mistakes, not on the national stage, not on the theater that goes across Canada, and to learn uh, by having up close and personal connections with people, high touch connections um, in their own community. And so, uh, and I would tell students this all the time, uh, some would listen, some wouldn't. Everybody wants to go to the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star and TVO and, and the National and of course CBC was the top of the list here, such a great connection between us and the CBC. And I would say, hey, get a map out. And get a map out and look at all the cities in between. Look at Hamilton, look at Waterloo, look at uh, Sarnia, look at Windsor. These are places where you can go. There are tremendous stories. We've got a mob hit once a week in Hamilton. You want great news? You know, there's news everywhere. Um, Windsor's a great news town, right? Border city, there's always great stuff. And the students, inevitably, that went to those middle-sized communities on their internships or worked in London at the LFP, and you've had many of our students, came back with great stories about their experiences and, and what they learned. So from the smallest of communities to the middle, uh, that's a great learning ground. If you want to go to the smoke, if you want to go to New York or Toronto, that's great too later. But I think uh, our, our communities offer students a, a great learning ground for sure. If I can just jump in on that. Please. When I started out, um, my dad, oddly enough, was one of my biggest questions. He says, why would you want to start a newspaper? And I told him, and he says, well, how are you going to fill it? <laughs> like, in Petrolia, really? You're not going to have it. And there are stories in every community. You Absolutely. just have to open your eyes Absolutely. to them. Absolutely. And if you're a journalist, it doesn't matter if they're the big stories in the big centers. A good story is a good story, and you can really ex be excited about being a journalist. I talked to an eight-year-old kid with cerebral palsy. It was one of the best stories I did this week. I loved it. Absolutely. So Mary, I, 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 sorry, yeah, I, to jump in. I would say uh, for the students here, I mean, you know, it might be a mid-sized city, uh, the journalism school, but some of the journalists sitting to my left here are ma winning major awards. Absolutely. Right? And Mitchner, Randy, and, and the, the fraud story, yeah. when you win a yeah. major award, you've got to, you know, you can talk to these people, right? You can yeah. have access to them. They're operating at the highest level exactly. of journalism. I think also when you're looking to a smaller community, I think about the fact that you can actually do explore all sorts of different avenues and you're not being kind of pigeonholed into covering one kind of area mm -hmm. you know there's su such such an opportunity to kind of explore different issues now I'm being given a signal that I think it's time um, so I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming out and I'd like to ask Natalie Turvey to come up she's the executive director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation who had a a role in bringing all of this together today. Uh, good afternoon. As Paul said, I am the Executive Director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation. My name is Natalie Turvey. This uh, has been an outstanding conversation on why trusted news matters now more than ever and everywhere. Uh, our thanks to FIMS uh, and to the Asper Fellowship in Media for hosting us in this terrific space and for making this timely and important conversation possible. It is critically important that we all understand and acknowledge what is happening to local news in Canada and in North America uh, and its implications on our citizens and to our democracy, but it's also so wonderful to celebrate and highlight some of the bright spots in Canadian local media when the business model is under so much pressure. 
Our gratitude to all of our speakers today for their insights, insights on why trusted news matters. Uh, a special thanks to Joshua Benton uh, for joining us from Boston. 48 hours ago, he was presenting a talk in China, so we're grateful to have him here. Uh, our thanks to the always terrific Paul Benedetti uh, for being our moderator and for the work he put into making this a conversation we can all benefit from. And a uh, huge gratitude to Kathy English for putting today's program together. She's been a longtime board member of the CJF. She's our programming chair, a tour de force around the work uh, that we do. I'm lucky to call her a friend and mentor. And uh, she's very much a steady and faithful advocate for the integrity of journalism in Canada. Please join me in a round of applause for all of our speakers here today. The Asper Fellowship in Media is a critical program at a time when journalism is being rocked by so many disruptive forces. Its mission to promote public discussion about Canadian media and the industry is very much aligned with our own mandate at the CJF and it's been an honour to support this event. To tell you a bit about our work, and I think I can do this there. Uh, this, for more than 25 years, uh, the CJF has been uh, a vital participant in providing programs and initiatives that contribute to better journalism in Canada and highlight the critical role media plays in a healthy democracy. Our motto, as journalism goes, so goes democracy, feels like a rallying cry and more important than ever in these challenging and unpredictable times. The CJF runs a prestigious annual awards and fellowships program. I was so thrilled to see both Randy and Heather, past recipients of our CJF Jacqueline Award in Excellence in Journalism on the stage today. We also give stage to innovation and experimentation in the business model, and we highlight the power of journalism to hold the world around us accountable. The foundation also fosters opportunities for training, research, and education. Uh, this year, we're very proud to have created the first and only news literacy program for students aged 9 to 19 in Canada called NewsWise. The program starts with the next generation of news and information consumers to equip them with the skills and tools they need to find and filter accurate sources of information online. And on May 3rd, uh, we launched the first ever World News Day to raise awareness about the value of fair and independent journalism in the lives of citizens and a functioning democracy. News outlets from across Canada participated in live events in Toronto and Montreal, and hundreds of Canadians gathered uh, at these events featuring powerful testimonies, testimonials from citizens uh, whose lives and communities have been changed by journalism alongside the journalists uh, who told their stories and Canada's uh, top musical talent also lent their support to our cause. And through our monthly J Talks, the CJF's public speaker series, we facilitate a dialogue among journalists, the business community, academics, students and citizens about the role of Canadian media and the ongoing challenges for journalism in the digital era. We have some outstanding events coming up in Toronto uh, and we hope you can join us. On November 4th, we have the investigative journalist of the year who keeps landing bombshell after bombshell and he's all of 30. Ronan Farrow is with us for a conversation with the Globe and Mail's Robin Doolittle. And on November 8th, another journalistic powerhouse, Suzanne Craig, is in Toronto to talk about how Trump got rich and the story behind her massive investigation that landed in the New York Times this month. And on November 29th, we have a Canadian exclusive, a book launch with venerable former editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger, who will talk about his new book, Breaking News, and what it means to journalism in Canada and globally. Uh, you can have a look at our social media for details on these upcoming events. And it's now uh, my pleasure to invite you to join us for a cocktail reception uh, to continue this conversation. On behalf of Kathy English, the, the CJF and FIMS, thank you for joining us this afternoon.